Scott Harrop is our last speaker, and then we'll have questions. Um, Scott currently teaches in the Department of Middle Eastern and South Asian Languages and Cultures at the University of Virginia with Iran as an area of expertise. Uh, he's been an understudy and a longtime assistant to um, well-known Iranian scholar, Dr. R.K. Ramazani. Welcome, Scott. This is actually fun for me, um, partly to, to hear some good friends that I wanted to come here. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm reminded almost two, two decades ago, I had the chance to, after one of my trips to Iran, I had the chance to give a talk at National Defense University. And I was on a panel, I was followed by Gary Sick, and I made the mistake of covering a lot of ground, a lot of territory. And Gary got up after me and he says, I have a problem in the sense that Scott Harrop just covered everything I wanted to talk about. Um, so I was anticipating that because we had good speakers and I was anticipating David covering a lot of good ground. So I thought, gee, I don't want to get caught in that position again. How can I offer something different, something deeper to think about? And that's what I want to do. I want to offer, um, from my experiences, my good fortune traveling around Iran, working with Professor Ramazani, studying aspects of Iranian culture and history, I share David's sense that we're at a dangerous moment um, in U.S.-Iran relations. The current impasse between the U.S. and Iran is as dangerous as I've seen it in all my years of studying it and writing on the subject. And I'll mention a few things on that, but I want to give you, uh, leave you some reasons for optimism. Um, if you will, from my point of view, rational basis to be hopeful that, that if we can get past this next few weeks, um, and no October surprises, that uh, there is some grounds for hoping by which the United States and Iran can begin to address the serious differences between them. How are we doing with my voice? Can you hear me okay in the back? Okay, I'll, I'll bring it up. Thank you. Okay. First, the, the context. The, the debate that we just uh, endured um, between President Obama and Governor Romney. Um, unfortunately, on the subject of Iran, it deteriorated to essentially who could be tougher in ratcheting up the pressures of sanctions, of warnings, of moving red lines, and frankly, even with President Obama, I was hearing what's alarmed me, uh, um, a spit of changing goalposts. Uh, we had the references to Iran as the, the supposed number one threat to American interests. Um, I was, in some ways, impressed that Governor Romney refused to engage in hypotheticals. What if Israel would do this tomorrow, or what would he do if it, would he follow Israel's lead? And he avoided that hypothetical one. It was interesting that Governor Romney seemed to be trying to pull back to the middle, even as President uh, Obama was stressing how tough he had been, and the, uh, Governor Romney was saying that he would be tougher with the sanctions without quite knowing what that would mean. My question would be is, how exactly do you get tougher with the sanctions which already are quite well past the level of being crippling, so much for smart sanctions? Um, I actually, at the beginning of the Obama administration, had a great amount of optimism. There were certain things in the Obama administration's approach towards Iran, and, and I was fortunate to speak here previously on the subject of mutual respect and went into that great length, but I got to keep my remarks really tight and to the focus here. But my initial enthusiasm about the Obama administration's approach essentially ended the day that Dennis Ross was designated as special advisor on Middle East matters, and especially regarding Iran. Previously, he's been known in both the both Democratic and Republican administrations for being a very effective advocate looking out for Israeli interests, um, not exactly advancing the peace process to be generous and I'll leave it at that, but not previously having a reputation for being an observer and an analyst on Iran matters. Um, I think you can, to understand where the Obama administration went wrong vis-a-vis -vis Iran, all you have to do is look, at, look back at some of Dennis Ross's books before coming into office. Um, and if one of the things that the critiques that Dennis Ross made of the, the second Bush administration was its presumed lack of attention for international legitimacy, its lack of respect for international opinion. So next time around, before we take on one of the, the bad guys, instead of like in 2003 with Iraq, if you, when you go about taking on Iran, you have to work on building international support. And in the Dennis Ross playbook, that means at least have the appearance of conducting diplomacy, of conducting negotiations, um, and at the same time, putting the pressure on, putting the pressure on so that, on the logic that, well, these people only understand force, so if you put the pressure on as you're trying to say that you're willing to do negotiations, um, that they'll supposedly have a chance of success. You can also make the argument, as I'm about to get into, that the emphasis on pressures, on threats, you can almost make the case, deliberately undermine the chances for those negotiations to have a chance. Um, in any case, 
uh, from the point of view of building an international coalition, you could say, well, when the decision is finally made to use force vis-a-vis -vis Iran, at least we can say to the world, well, we tried diplomacy. We tried to be reasonable. And unlike uh, with 2003 with Iraq, we really did try to work out a deal. They weren't willing. There was no partner for peace. And therefore, we had to go the, the direction of force. I can hear that argument being made come February. And I'm concerned about that one. I know there are people inside the Obama administration that I'm hearing indications that, that they believe that there's, there's um, a willingness to go forward with some sort of an accommodation. I know there's some people in the Romney camp, not many, who also have a sense that you know, the United States and Iran, for all their differences, should be working, finding ways to resolve them. I'm not as optimistic about that. Um, I'm among those people that's um, even more so than Trita Parsi in his recent book, if you're not familiar with it, called A Single Roll of the Days. I, I'm of the view that so far between the United States and Iran, the one thing we haven't tried yet is serious diplomacy, serious negotiations. Now there's a whole series of quick objections that come up about that. And I'm going to, in general fashion, in some quick points for you to think about, to consider, to think about I mean, I'm going to handle some of these objections. The first one being, um, to some people, the, the assumption is, and it's a common point of view inside the Beltway, that the only language Iran understands is the language of force. And the only way they're going to eventually come on board, because our differences are so strong, is you have to be using pressure. And they will defend the Obama administration. Well, at least with the Obama administration, they were using economic pressures. That this was better than war, isn't it? that the liberal, if you're a liberal hawk or whatever you want to call it, that at least we were trying to use the tools of, of diplomacy vis-a-vis -vis economic pressures, and that that would supposedly work to the table. My own view of Iranian history, and you can see it in the book that I did with Sandra Mackey, um, all the work I've done with Professor Ramazani over the years, my own understandings of the subjects is that pressures and threats, and I wrote about this publicly, I had the fortune to write in Helena Coben's uh, blog uh, many times, even as, from a Western perspective, you might say, well, it's worked with this country, economic sanctions have tended to produce this and that result. In the context of Iran, if you know, if the more you begin to study Iran's history, its constant problems with foreign invaders, its problems with trying to, to maintain its independence vis-a-vis -vis the Russians or the British or the Americans, there is this deep suspicions of external pressures. So external pressures vis-a-vis -vis Iran, again and again in history, have tended to produce negative reactions. The Iranians don't respond well to threats. The whole business about the language of carrots and sticks. From an Iranian point of view, that's akin to the way you treat donkeys, not a proud civilization such as Iran. In Iran, there are intense memories of things that happened in 1906, their first constitutional revolution. The Iranians have been struggling with constitutional democracy and, uh, for quite some time. It's within the culture. That particular revolution that is, is widely remembered as having been crushed by the British and the Russians. Um, in 1953, David made references to it, the, the, the bitter memories, the perception that in a nationalist government that the Iranians had, yes, which was in a fundamental struggle with the British over the issues of Iran's right to nationalize its own oil. The Iranians were well ahead of the Arabs on that one. But that assertion of that right was believed to have been ripped away from them, particularly when the United States cooperated with the British in the intelligence operation that put the Shah back on the throne and overturned this nationalist government. And then, of course, the Iranians have the bitter memories of what had happened with the revolution, what happens in the early years of the iran iraq war, the perception that the external world was actively working against them, and that Iran would ultimately be the best defender of its own. So from my own point of view, the logic of pressures and threats is, especially vis-a-vis -vis Iran, is inherently counterproductive. So thinking that simply using sanctions is what's bringing Iran to the table today, in my view, is, is a bit delusional, um, wildly optimistic. But there is a potential truth to it, which I'll get to in just a moment. And that's my second point, is that the Iranians, the Islamic Republic, they're not inherently, quote, crazy. This is a, you know, when you study the actual behavior of the Islamic Republic in its foreign policy, you may not like what they've done, but you can see a constant, consistent pattern of dealing with difficult realities in comprehensive, in rational manners. Uh, I could cite for you lots of specific examples of that. Uh, with my students in the last class, we were talking about the early years of the Iran-Iraq War. There was this, I mean, Iran just had the, well, let's see, what are we on, 2012, 30 years ago, Iran was celebrating almost at this time, the fact that they had managed on their own to throw the inv Iraqi invader out of their country. There was an enormous pride over that achievement, that they had done that without the help of the rest of the world. 
Um, and they had done it through learning from mistakes. Now, there, there, is, there is this certain mythology um, by certain monarchist sources of Mir Tahiri and others stressing, well, the Iranians were fanatically driven. They would put the children in blankets and supposedly they would be going on to martyrdom. And there may have been some of that going on in the early years of the war, but by and large, during the course of the Iraq war, Iran learned from mistakes. Its success as of 1982 in throwing back the Iraqi invader was because of successful use of military tactics. The, the, yes, there was a lot of purges and problems going on inside the country, but the country as a whole did learn. And by 1986, the big concern in the West was, well, Iran may be isolated, but they're militarily making some extraordinary advances vis-a-vis -vis the Iraqis through patient learning in military strategy. We could go on to a, a series of issues where the Iranians were relatively pragmatic, um, that they weren't simply driven by a fanatical ideology. And, we could, and I, I loved when I'm doing my teaching or writing essays, I often talk about the paradoxes of Iran. You may be, you're probably most familiar from reading the New York Times and other sources about uh, President Ahmadinejad's uh, unfortunate rhetoric vis-a-vis -vis Israel. Now, we can get into issues about whether those were mistranslated comments, whether they were consistent or went further than things that Ayatollah Khomeini himself had said. I'm among those who in past writings have pointed out that it hurt Iran's reputation on the international stage, that it was not helpful to Iran's perspective and certainly made Iran an easy punching bag. And even in Iran's presidential elections, it became a subject of debate, whether or not the president's style was helpful or hurtful to Iran's policy. But at the very same time, in Iran, uh, two things are going on. One, the single most popular television program in the entire country uh, was translated as Zero Degree Turn, which was a film about, during World War II, the Iranian uh, ambassador, or no, I'm sorry, the charge, the second in command of the Iranian embassy in Vichy, France, was responsible for helping quite a few Iranian, I'm sorry, French, thank you, French Jews to escape from the Nazis. In effect, you had an Iranian diplomatic playing the role, he was an Iranian Schindler. And yes, the Iranians made a dramatic television series highlighting that yes, this was I Iranians engaging nobly and proudly in, in coming to the assistance of Jews. So at the very same time you have a, a, a president appearing to minimize the, the extent of the Holocaust at the same time in the same country, they're, they're stressing, wait a minute, th this is something worth looking into. On the subject of Iran's willingness to negotiate with Israel, now yes, the official rhetoric is that no, we're not going to work with Israel, and Israel is, you know, you, you have various Iranian political figures saying, this is, a, this is a problem and it's going to vanish with the time, or that there's lots of reasons why Muslims across the region resent Israel. But in actual practice, again and again, even going back to Khomeini himself, there has been a pragma, it, it's already in the, it, if you will, in the rhetoric of key leaders inside Iran, that if the Palestinians and the Israelis can figure out a way to resolve their conflict, their dispute, their problems between them, that bottom line, Iran won't be more Palestinian than the Palestinians. Now the caveat that usually follows after that, and I remember Kamal Karazi uh, making the case when he was ambassador to the UN saying, at this point, we currently don't believe that the Israelis will be willing to make the necessary adjustments to have a just peace with the Palestinians. But if they would, if they would, Iran would not stand in its way. That's something interesting. It's again further evidence, and there's lots more cases I could bring to you of Iran having a pragmatic streak to it. Third big point. A lot of people will say, well, it's all well and good for you to be saying that the Obama administration or the Romney administration should be reaching out to Iran. But a lot of uh, critics will, uh, will say, but Iran fundamentally needs to be, for the, I mean, the Islamic revolution needs to be anti-American, that it's somehow part of their DNA, mm -hmm. that, they that they have to have bad relations with the United States um, in order to justify their, if you will, legitimacy within the system. It's somehow mixed in between that. Now, to most of you, listening to Western news sources, you would say, well, what's wrong with that? And I'd say, there's a lot wrong with that. Uh, partly, it goes back to personal experiences. In, in my trips traveling around Iran, and I, I can tell you stories and anecdotes about this afterwards, but one of, one of the biggest ones that really brought this home to me is my very first trip to Iran, January 1991. Delicate time. American bombs were falling on Iraq. Um, wasn't quite sure how well I'd be received. I'm standing next to Khomeini's shrine, his tomb, in the, next to his tomb in the center of that great shrine which was just then being built. I'm standing there looking next to it. I'm actually wearing a western raincoat, which I suppose could have looked like a, a well, an intelligence trench coat or whatever. I'm just amazed by this whole scene. I'm here right next to Ayatollah Khomeini's shrine. I, and I lost track of time, didn't have anybody with me, and I turn around and there's this semicircle of, well, 
at the time, the standard was, you know, the, the, the week old beer. Uh, guys in these army jackets, it was only three years after the Iran-Iraq War, and they're all in this semicircle, and they're all kind of looking at me kind of stern, and I'm instantly panicking. And um, I'm starting to think, ah, oh, what have I done? And I'm trying, my Persian is very bad, and I started, you know, bibakshi, uh, uh, please forgive me, I didn't mean to offend anybody. I, you know, I'm thinking maybe an American shouldn't be standing this close to Khomeini's shrine. And, um, and I'm fumbling all over myself, and suddenly this one guy in the center steps forward, um, and says, uh, where are you from? And that one I was trying to remember, what's the word for Canadian? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but instead I, I knew enough to say, I'm from America. And then again, I'm, you know, eyes go big and they're starting to, and I'm starting to panic again. And then he said, he, he puts his hands back up and down. He said, it's okay, it's okay, I'm from Georgia Tech. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, then we and then I proceeded to get invitations to every single one of their homes in classic Iranian traditional fashion. You know, I was the American, I was the long lost cousin. It, it's, that's a terribly shortened story, but there's a bigger point to it. In all my travels across Iran, and, and my co-author Sandra Mackey's, yeah, we had some scrapes, we had some interesting problems in places that maybe we were pushing the limits on, but by and large, whether we were in conservative families, families of clerics, families of shopkeepers, um, or, in one case, my own case, traveling on a third class bus from uh, Esfahan to, to um, well, that's a long story. Um, in all of those experiences, I never once felt uncomfortable as an American. There is a residual, intense curiosity about Americans. My apologies, Helena, but Iranians don't think the same way about the English, because they have this intense, even though I would argue that British academia does a far better job at its Persian studies, the British Museum has done some magnificent work recently on the Cyrus Cylinder. But um, at the cultural level in Iran, they remember what happened in 1906. They also, vis-a-vis -vis the British, I mean, still de the sense of Britain, perfidious Albion, had betrayed us. You know, they helped inspire our constitutional revolution, and then when we needed them, they permitted the Russians to shell our modulus, our parliament. But towards Americas, they remember a lot of key American figures who helped Iran with the re revival of its own culture. There is this, this curiosity about Americans, curiosity, this appreciation about American scholars, this sense that, and I think there's something to this, that there's a lot in common between the Iranian culture and American culture. One of these days I want to do a book comparing the Iranian and the American revolutions, because I see a lot of parallels between the two. Got to get around to doing that. Um, but in any case, we have this sense, okay, now that's at the level of culture, but it also applies at the level of politics. Again, some of my critics would sit there and say, yes, but, but then there's Khamenei, or then there's Khomeini. Well, yes, I've been reading pre um, current leader Khamenei's addresses and speeches since 1984, including his recent ones. It was Khamenei, who was then as president in 1989, who was articulating the case for what became known, and Professor Ramzani wrote on it, Iran's open door foreign policy, in which they were looking at ways in which relations between the supposed great Satan between the United States and Iran could be resolved. Khomeini himself would say, we've kept relations with the United States ajar in hopes that these things could be resolved. In my, ex well, in my studies of Iran, I don't see it inherently as part of the system to have, quote unquote, a fight to the death relationship with the United States. Quite the contrary. I see lots of evidences by which things could be opened up. In fact, even even with Khomeini, the line was often, okay, we can have relations with the United States, but it has to be relations between equals. No more relations of the lion and the lamb. It has to be fundamentally between equals. Two more points. First one, uh, the sex, uh, well, my fourth point overall, is that between Iran and the United States, if we're going to get off the dime, if negotiations are going to have a chance next year, then there was something that Obama did the first year that still matters, and that's the the concept of mutual respect. The concept of mutual respect, and, I, and I've got, you can Google my name, and there's a lot of important things on that. It's, it's not that alien to the American experience. Dwight Eisenhower closed his famous farewell address with a reference to mutual respect and um, how important it was for how we address the world. Richard Nixon used mutual respect as the core basis on the week that changed the world as he went to China. And yeah, we've got a lot of differences with Iran um, between our two systems. But from the, it, that phrase, mutual respect, when President Obama in March of 2009 used it in his no-ruse address, my understanding is that it caused a sense argument that in advancing the, the community of Islam, or in this case, advancing the interests of Iran, that it made sense to figure out ways to compromise, even with a perceived bully, 
if, the, if you can figure out ways to say, okay, we're going to be advancing, we'll be protecting our interests. And right now, yes, Iran is, is in serious trouble. It's got major problems. It's economic sanctions. The, the lessons of 1951 to 53 is that Iran doesn't buckle when faced with ruinous international sanctions. But on the other hand, the current leadership of Iran, if I understand them correctly, is quite capable of, of recognizing that pain. And even though they might not be fearful of, of a revolution from within, there is still the sense of that this situation is not in our country's interest. And is there any way we can figure out a way to resolve it? And my just, my just quick point to you is that they, Iran is quite capable of compromise even in the face of severe external pressures. And it's upon these points that I still have some optimism that we could get through next year without that calamitous war, which David Swanson just appropriately reminded us of that we don't want. So thank you very much. Thank you.